because you don't want to listen to a boring pastor and I really don't want to preach to a boring audience, all right? So let's kind of have a conversation back and forth this morning. Before we jump into where I want to go in this message series free, we're going to be talking about the spirit of anger and how to cast out the spirit of anger. But, uh, you know, when you have as many children as I have, I have five kids, okay? I have a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, a 4-year-old, and a 1-year-old. I've got my basketball team, my starting five, all right? I've got them. When you've got as many kids as I have, you have lots of opportunities for sermon pulpit material and sermon stories, right? And so today's story comes to you from my children uh, and me, right? So, so my, my son, JJ, he's 12 years old. And if you are ever on like who wants to be a millionaire or whoever is on like maybe Jeopardy or something, you get to phone a friend maybe about a Star Wars question, my son, JJ, I challenge you, he knows all the facts, all the statistics, all the heroes, all the things about all the things about all the things about all the movies and what will happen in the next one probably, right? Like, like he knows the info. Now, good old dad over here uh, didn't grow up watching Star Wars. I know I'm going to get booed off the platform here in a second. I tried to watch Star Wars. They took me back to some movie. I don't know if it was the sixth one or the third one that they said was somehow the first one or something like that. And they tried to go through the whole thing with me. And I was like so tired that day, I literally fell asleep in the movie. So like, hey, not, not a Star Wars, you know, uh, understanded guy up here. But my kids loved this whole thing. So I said, okay, any good father knows that you have to mess with your kids. Yes. This is an unwritten rule. It's unspoken, but if you have children, you have to mess with your children. Dads to be, I'm trying to help you out here, okay? You have to mess with your kids, but you have to know the line because there is a line where you go, okay, you're just crossing the line. You're just making them upset, making them angry. Some of y'all don't know the line, and that's another whole message, right, for another time. But a good dad knows the line and says, I'm going to push up to that line, because it's so fun. All right, it really is so fun. So knowing that my children love Star Wars, this, this Mandalorian character was going to come out. Y'all, How many of y'all watched the Star Wars Mandalorian season stuff that came out? Okay, a lot of you guys did. So in that, I knew it was coming up, and I'm trying to be a good dad. I want to know what's like, hey, if you're into it, son, I want to try to figure out how to be into it with you, right? I'm trying to be a good dad. And so I told him, I said, hey, guys, y'all do know that I am the real Mandalorian, right? Of course, my younger kids are looking up at me and kind of with that look like, he probably is the Mandalorian. My younger ones, my younger ones. Now, my older ones, they're looking at me very skeptical and especially JJ, my 12-year-old. He goes, Dad, you're not the real Mandalorian. I said, son, I am the real Mandalorian. He said, Dad, you are not the real Mandalorian. I said, do you want me to prove it to you? And it got that quiet. 
And he said, yeah, I do want you to prove to me that you're the real Mandalorian. I said, okay, I will prove to you I'm the real Mandalorian. So I knew that based on the time zones and how things worked with the TV show, that just a little few hours before like the premiere, you can look up spoilers to things. So I looked up spoilers to whatever was going to happen in the episode that night. And so I don't know enough about Star Wars to tell you anything more than there's a Luke Skywalker and Darth Maul and a Princess Leia. That's all I know. And I only know Princess Leia because of Friends and Ross and Rachel and that whole thing. You know, so that's the only, I, I'm very loosely affiliated with Star Wars in any way. But I go, if I can just get a few pieces of spoilers, I'm the real Mandalorian. Right? So, so I tell my kids, we got to sit down to watch it together. I say, hey, you guys excited? Of course, they've been waiting. They know when it's going to come out. They know what day. You wake up and it's like, let's watch this. I go, all right, let's go. So we get started. I pause it. I go, hey, guys, you told me to prove to you that I'm a real man. Do you, are you sure you want me to tell you what's going to happen in this episode? Of course, dad, you're not the real Mandalorian. You're not going to be able to tell us what happens. I was there. I remember shooting these scenes. I remember these actors and actresses, and of course, they know who the actors are that play the characters, right? So they're like, that's the actor. You're showing me a picture on Google. This is the actor that's the Mandalorian. That's all just a guys. I'm the real Mandalorian. So sitting there, we're in this tension match back and forth. Younger ones are looking at these guys like he's a superhero going, you know, dad might be a superhero. Maybe he is. I say, guys, I'm going to tell you what happens in the episode. I told them a few spoilers, and I'll tell you, it was the funnest thing in all the world. When they saw it play out on the screen, they looked over at me. <laughs> and they said, Dad, how did you do this? And I was good. Until I didn't know in this season he was going to take his helmet off, right? <laughs> So he took his helmet off and they turned their finger at me with anger and said, Dad, you are not the real Mandalorian. Said, guys, how many times do I have to prove this to you? I said, that's the second helmet that I wear. I said, I was wearing two helmets. I'm a pastor and I don't want anybody to know that I'm a pastor. So I had to put on that other helmet in order to not have a whole bunch of people rush into the church because they wanted to see the real Mandalorian. So there it is right there. <laughs> Younger ones believe me, my older ones did not. My son JJ called me aside. He said, dad, he says, I know you're lying to us. This is the line. This is the line, Dad, where you know, okay, I can't, I don't want to be a liar. I don't want them to not trust me anymore. So I have to make sure that I clear the air. My oldest son's old enough to know. So I said, I said, JJ, here's the deal, man. I said, I'm not the real Mandalorian. I said, I'm seeing that it's, because this is like, dude, this is his world. I have busted everything up. And I'm commenting on things I know nothing about. And he knows that about me. So he's going, Dad, I'm, I'm frustrated. You're lying. You're this, that. I said, okay, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not the real Mandalorian. I said, I will not speak of this anymore because I don't want to infuriate you, frustrate you, make you continually upset. I said, but is there any way I can just say this to, to the other kids? And he's like, oh, yeah, just do whatever you want, right? Like, you know, you <laughs> So I drop the case. I totally just drop it. I've not mentioned that I'm the Mandalorian, but today when I woke up, my kids got me the Dadalorian shirt. The Dadalorian, he's got my kids' names on here, which I think is really pretty cool. And so I, I put this on this morning, and right when I put it on, I, I go up and I go, hey guys, thank you so much for this. I go, I feel like myself again. <laughs> so there's that, just a little dad life stuff there for you on Father's Day. But I thought, man, it definitely relates to anger. My son was getting ticked. We believe at this church that demons are on mission from the enemy to do what? To steal, kill, and destroy. And as Christians, Jesus has given us power and authority over demons and evil spirits. In Jesus' day, you read so many stories of the followers of Jesus casting out demons, setting cap captives free. This was so commonplace, but the church world today has lost sight of what God has called us to do. If you've missed this series, we're on like week seven or eight of this series. I don't even know where we're at in this series. We're pretty deep into this series. I give you a whole backstory on why we stand on this position that this is for today in the previous week. So I encourage you to go online, watch those messages. If you just want more information, we went over so much. But I'll give you one verse today if you were uh, kind of brand new visiting us here and it just kind of sets the stage. It says, heal the sick. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Heal the sick, raise the dead, 
Cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. The next verse says, freely you have received, therefore freely give. Today I wanna talk about that demon of anger. What is the demon of anger? It's that overwhelming desire to lash out, to use our words to hurt. How many of you would be honest in the house of God this morning or if you're watching online, you would be honest and you'd raise your hand and say, you know what? I know someone that loses it at times or I am that person that loses it at times. Would you lift your hand? We wanna be real in the house of God today. Let's be honest today. Uh, we got a lot of lying spirits in the room too. So we'll deal with that in a future week. <laughs> Don't be all booing me. <laughs> How many of you would be honest and say, you know what, that can be me at times and anger, well, here's what it does. It can take root in our hearts and really turn us very hateful. It moves from anger into hate. Many times people are angry and they begin to lash out, but more often than not, they're not just angry about the situation. Oftentimes they're angry with themselves. Oftentimes. Then it can lead into a thing called self-hatred. Where you lash out on somebody, you say words that you don't really mean or you shouldn't even say at all. And then all of a sudden you kind of catch your breath after it's all over. It maybe feels good in the moment, but then you catch your breath and you go, wow, I cannot believe I just said that. I cannot believe I just, this is not who I really am. Have you heard people say this statement? That's not who I really am. Put your hands up if you've seen this before. This is not who I really am. Why is that statement said that way? Because they're right. Who they are and who God has called us to be is different than the spirit that overtakes many times a person and possesses. And when it possesses the vessel, it turns us into a person that we don't want to be and that God didn't call us to be. Today, I wanna to read a story out of Genesis chapter four. If you have your Bibles, turn and click over to Genesis chapter four that talks about a man who was filled with anger and let his anger get the best of him. Um, as we read today, we're gonna to learn the Bible from Genesis four, verses one through 13. My job is to teach you the Bible today. Let's get started. Adam made love to his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. Now, real quick, some of you guys, when I say the word Cain, you think of WWE, the big red monster, Cain, right? Not the same Cain that we're talking about here, but you get a good visual illustration there. Maybe not too far off of what Cain really was all about. Adam made life to, love to his wife Eve. She became pregnant, gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Cain and Abel. Everybody say Cain and Abel on the count of three. One, two, three. Cain and Abel. One more time. One, two, three. Cain and Abel. We're gonna learn about Cain and Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks. He was a shepherd. And Cain, he worked the soil. He was a farmer. In the course of time, that's significant. We'll tell you why in a second. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering. Fat portions from some of the firstborn, that's significant, we'll tell you why in a second. Fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Now, this isn't the subject of where I'm going today, but I don't wanna miss it because it's too good to go past. Why is God not accepting the offering from Cain, but he's accepting the offering from Abel? It's like, hey man, both of them brought an offering to the Lord. Why is one accepted and why is one not? Couple thoughts. Number one is when you're bringing an offering to God, you don't in the course of time bring an offering. The difference between Cain and the difference between Abel is Abel brought the first of his offering. He looked at his flock and he said, which one's the best? Which one came first? I'm going to trust God in this and give this as my offering. In the course of time, after Cain kind of realized I have all that I need, then he decided to bring an offering to the Lord. So step one is he didn't do it the right way. Step one. Step two is, well, he brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. So Cain, he brought the wrong offering. So it wasn't just that he delayed in bringing a offering. 
He brought the wrong offering. You say, well, what's wrong with the vegetables and the fruits that he brought from the, the soil? Well, see, back in the day, anything in the Old Testament that you read about, a lot of times had symbolism to what God was gonna do in the New Testament. So let's talk about it. The prophets in the Old Testament, they prophesied that one day a lamb would be slain on a cross. His name would be Jesus, that he would shed his blood for the payment of sin, that it would take the, the perfect blood of a spotless lamb to cover the sin of the entire world. So when we look way back here to this story and we say in the course of time, he brought fruits and vegetables, but Abel also brought the offering. He brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. What we see here is that Abel is bringing a sacrifice to God and he's shedding the blood of the best of his animals, the first. And it's symbolic of what Jesus was gonna do in the future. They had an understanding of what they were to do. There was a plan, and we're gonna read about that. It says, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So, so Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord says to Cain, he says, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Now, real quick, is God all-knowing, or does he need us to help him out to understand? Which one? He knows it all. So he's being conversational with him, much like he's conversational with us. And he says, hey, what are you doing? And we hear the voice going, why are we here? Why are we involved in this? What are we doing? Why are we saying that that way? Why are we responding that way? We hear the voice too. God is conversational with us. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Then he says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you had brought the right proper gift, you would have been accepted. If you had done it the right way, you would absolutely be accepted. He says, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Sin is crouching at your door. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke a message all about the open doors that we give to the enemy where these evil spirits come through the open doors. Right here, it says sin is crouching at your door, much like a lion. The Bible says like a roaring lion is crouching down, waiting to pounce on somebody, looking for someone to devour. Sin is crouching at the door and it desires to have you. Then Jesus, God says, but you must rule over it. Sin is gonna be waiting for us at the door. And if you open the door to whatever it is, it desires to take you out and to harm you. We have to learn to rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, so God gives him clear instruction like, here's what you did wrong, here's what should happen. You shouldn't be angry. Here's the right thing, here's where you went wrong. Let's move forward. Now Cain says to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and he killed him. Anger led to the very first premeditated murder in the Bible. It was premeditated. He knew, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, he attacked his brother. That, that anger demon turned into something even more turned into a death and murder demon. We've been talking about this. Let's continue. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Time out. Do you think God knows where Abel's at? Yes. Yep. He doesn't need his help. He's being conversational with him. Where's your brother Abel? I don't know. He replied, am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> that's brotherly love right there. Right? That's how it works. I don't know. Mom, it's your issue, not mine. Dad, it's your issue, not mine. I'm just the guy here. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother, brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now he's not asking him, what have you done? Because he didn't know. He's wanting him to know, hey, what have you done? Listen, I'm holding you accountable here. Don't you realize that I don't even have to go where he's at and know what happened? I already know what happened. Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. This is huge. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. Something is being taken away from Cain. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. 
Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Anger took over in this situation. And again, it led to Cain committing the very first murder in the Bible. Maybe anger hasn't led you to physically murder somebody, but maybe it's led you to relationally murder somebody. Relational murder is when you've broken, severed, hurt, or destroyed relationships. Could be relationships with your parents, could be relationship with your spouse, or your kids, or your coworkers, or your friends. Anger many times destroys relationships. One day you look in the mirror and you feel like, man, just nobody understands. And again, you feel good in the moment telling that person off, but horrible later when you catch your breath and you go, what came over me? The demon of anger. The demon of anger doesn't care about you. And it definitely doesn't care about your relationship with those around you, with others. When we renounce and reject the spirit of anger and we ask God to replace that with the fruits of the Holy Spirit, think about the fruits of the Holy Spirit for a second. The Holy Spirit's fruits, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. This is just a list of few. All of those are essentially the exact opposite of anger. What else does the Bible say about anger? Again, just teaching through God's word, Ephesians 4 says this, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Can I tell you, from personal experience, this is really, 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 really hard to obey. It can be very, very difficult. But in our anger, our command from our Father is in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And then he says, and do not give the devil a foothold in your life. And guys, we gotta refuse this demon of anger. We gotta renounce and reject it. We're not gonna do what the rest of the world's gonna do. We refuse to fight that way. That's not what we do. We fight on our knees with our hands lifted high. That's what we do, okay? We don't give the devil a foot place because if we give him a foothold, he'll take way more. He never just stays wherever you think. I'll just let you go right now. No, 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 no. What else does the Bible say? James 1, 19 through 25 says, my dear brothers and sisters, I want you to take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. In other words, take God's word, download it, make it who you are. This is who God called you to be. Take the word that's been humbly planted in you and guess what? It has the power to save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. This is the difference between a person who shows up at church and says, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of God. I believe the things that he has in his Bible. Well, we can st say that we believe these things, but if our actions don't line up to the beliefs that we say we have in our heart, something's off. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Anyone who listens to this word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. Don't miss this, I wanna teach this. This is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, he goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. I'm gonna explain what that means in a second. This verse will help us. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom 
and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. What does this mean? It means that when we look, look into the mirror, we look into the perfect law of God. The Bible is God's word and it's our mirror. And when we look at God's word and we say, this is what God desires us to look like. As fathers, as mothers, as brothers and sisters, as Christians, this is God's plan. This is what he wants from me. This is how I'm supposed to respond to every situation. We align ourselves to what he says. That's looking in the mirror. What did the scripture say? Let's go back a little bit. Do not merely listen to the word, so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word, but does not do what it says, like someone who looks at his face in the mirror. There it is. I'm looking. I see what God says I'm supposed to look like. And after looking at himself, though, what's he do? He goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. This is, I, sh I show up to church and, and yeah, pastor, this is what we are. This is who we are. I stand firm. I'm a follower of Jesus. I stand in that truth. But then I walk out and do whatever I want in the rest of the world. I forget who God called me to look like. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. What a powerful word. Let's continue. Proverbs 19. What else does it say about anger? A person's wisdom yields patience. A person's wisdom yields patience. If you have no patience, you have very little wisdom. Person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Can I just say as your pastor, when I read the word and I teach through and preach through the word, I don't always go, oh man, this is just the easiest stuff in the world to do. Sometimes I'm going, oh, oh really? But God, don't you see all the, Person's wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit. This is important. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit for anger resides in the lap of fools. You know what I got a picture of when I read that verse? Uh, my grandma, when we go to her house, she had, uh, she had little chihuahuas everywhere, all right? Little chihuahuas everywhere. And she had the meanest chihuahuas you'd ever seen in your entire life. Like they, you know, going to grandma's house, it's immediate fear that the dog's gonna bite you. Like that, that's, that's the scenario. And, and I started reading this, do not be quickly provoked in your spirit for anger resides in the lap of fools. She was the only one that could touch that dog without that dog just taking someone's hand off. And I just picture her just petting that dog. He's in her lap. And you know what? Anytime anybody came in, it barked at him. It was protective dog. I thought it was a pit bull or something like, you know, all the time. That's this verse. Do not be quick, quickly provoked in your spirit. For anger resides just right there, ready to go. Bad dog impression. I'm not an impressionist. I'm the dad Alorian, okay? So I'm gonna stick to who I am. And Proverbs 15:1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15:18. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. Proverbs 22, 24 through 25 says, do not make friends with a hot tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. Proverbs 14, 29, whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick tempered displays foolishness. This is the hardest one. If you didn't think it was hard yet and you haven't like, ugh, here's the next one. It's real hard. Romans 12, 17 says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, which means it may not be possible, but if it is possible, as far as depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. 
Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, here's where it gets so tough. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. (laughs) In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. I think the Bible's funny sometimes. Like, oh man, what is this? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If today you're battling a demon of anger, let me show you the pathway to get rid of that and to cast it out. Steps to freedom this morning. Number one is you have to start a relationship with Jesus. Why? Because there is no authority that can take out an evil demonic spirit except for Jesus Christ. He's the only name above all names that has the authority to get rid of it. So if you come forward to get rid of an evil spirit today, and maybe it's not just anger, and you know there's a lot going on. We've set a lot of people free this morning already in first service, all sorts of issues. Whatever those issues are, we can't do anything without you having a relationship with Jesus. You have to have faith to believe that Jesus really died on the cross for you. He really rose again, and he really does want to empower you with his Holy Spirit to give you freedom. That's like step one. Many times before people received a miracle of healing in the Bible, he would ask them, do you believe? Your faith has made you whole. So you can't get free on some of this stuff without that relationship, with any of it really, without a relationship with Jesus. So step one is I'm gonna lead you through a prayer to start that relationship with Jesus today. I'll do that in just a second. But there's a second prayer we're gonna talk about today. The second one is where we renounce and reject the evil spirit or the demon of anger. Again, this is interchangeable. It could be a demon of pride. It could be a lying demon. It could be a sexual demon. There's lots of demons that we could deal with. Today we've been talking about anger. So we're gonna renounce and reject through that prayer, the spirit of anger. Step three is we actually have to cast out the demon. Okay, when we renounce and reject and say, I don't want it, this is where our prayer partners are gonna come forward. If I can get our prayer partners to stand back up, line up across the front, be ready to do some deliverance ministry, uh, that would be great. But we gotta have them cast out the demon. First question they're gonna ask you when you come up is, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Hopefully you'll say yes. If you don't say yet or you don't know Jesus yet, again, I'll lead you through the prayer on how to do that in just a second. The second thing you're gonna say, did you pray to renounce and reject the evil spirit of anger? Hopefully you'll say yes. They're gonna look at you in the eyes. They're probably gonna anoint your head with some oil to represent the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. And then they're gonna look at you in the eye and they're gonna ask you to keep your eyes focused on them. And they're gonna look at that demon and they're gonna command it by the power of Jesus Christ to be bound up, to be quiet, and to go to the abyss in Jesus' name. The fourth step is they're gonna help you be filled with the Holy Spirit. Whatever areas of our life where that spirit, that demon of anger has resided, we don't want those places to be void. We want them to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So they're gonna encourage you to request the Holy Spirit to come into your life. And then the last one is after you do this process, I really wanna encourage you to go back to your seat and worship God as a set free person. Because when we worship, let me be very clear, I'll say it like this, worship is your warfare. Worship is your weapon against the enemy. It lets every demonic presence that would try to come and attack, it lets them know where your faith lies in Jesus Christ. And you're protected by the power of God, amen, amen. So this is our steps to freedom. We're gonna start with step one right now. If you feel led to pray, pray along with us, okay? Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus for me. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me for doing life my way. Show me your way. Fill me with your spirit guide me by your word. Make me who you created me to be. Amen. Let's welcome people into the family of God today. Amen. Amen. Now listen, I wouldn't be a good pastor if I didn't give you some next steps, okay? I want to guide you along the pathway. If you just made a decision 
to ask Jesus to be Lord of your life, I want you to pull out your phone and text the word new me with no spaces in it. New me to 55498. New me to 55498. We're going to send you a, a response back and help you understand more about the prayer you prayed and give you those next steps to walk with Jesus in your life. Now, if you don't recall, step two of all this was renounce and reject the evil spirit. We're talking about the demon of anger. If you got anger on you and you're aware of it, let's pray to renounce and reject. Say it with me. Say, God, I do not want a spirit of anger near me, in me, or following me. I renounce and reject the spirit of anger. I desire to be set free. I ask you to give me love, joy, and peace. Help me to be patient and respond with self-control. Amen. I want you to stand to your feet right now. Do not leave at this time. This is a time of deliverance and ministry time. We're going to ask our worship team to step forward uh, to sing a song of worship. If you're not forward in line right now to get that deliverance, I want you to worship with all that you've got. We're going to be closing the service probably in the next five to seven minutes. With that said, on the count of three, I want you to get up out of your seat. Push everybody out of your way. Get up here. Not in anger, but push them out of the way here and get your deliverance in Jesus' name. One, two, three. Let's move.
that the Holy Spirit is not real and that we don't have authority over demons. Go ask any of these people that are getting set free right now what just happened to them and they will be a testimony to you of the Holy Spirit's presence in their life and that anger being cast off of them in Jesus' name. I promise you that's the story. Today is a special day because it's Father's Day and once a year, I give the fathers the gift of going home early and ending church earlier than normal. So today, thank you so much for being here. We're gonna say goodbye to our online campus on the count of three. One, two, three, goodbye. We say goodbye to them. Unfortunately, now we gotta say goodbye to you.